Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have uh, Tim Husudinov and uh, close enough, close enough, Tim. I'll, I'll say it fast, that way it sounds better. And then, and also, I can say this one, Edwin Atterbury. Atterbury. Yes. Edwin Atterbury. Welcome to the show. Thank Edwin you. is the, uh, the, uh, the principal in the I Am Happy uh, project, and uh, Tim is with uh, Integrate Cal Community Partners Benefit Corporation which is all about uh, making the cannabis business work in California. That's right. Thank you very much for being part of the show. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some economic issues and political issues. We'll get to the State of the Union. But first, I'd like to talk about the fact that uh, peak oil done uh, went away. Uh, peak oil didn't happen like it was projected to happen. United States oil production is now hitting 10 million barrels per day. Why is that significant? It's the first time it's been that high since 1970. Why are we producing more oil than ever when uh, supposedly it's, it's a finite resource? Well, uh, one of the reasons is improvements in technologies with shale extraction. Okay. Um, so like the, the, uh, the Bakken site in the uh, Montana and North Dakota. That's been uh, coming back online. There was a bit of a dip there the last few years, but uh, the technologies are apparently exceeding market expectations for the, the efficiencies and the, and the lowering of costs to do that. Um, also, uh, some of that has to do with recent policy changes, uh, approving uh, different kinds of uh, drill sites in different places, and they uh, and, and some of uh, some of those places are. Uh, nature or uh, reserves or, or parks. Um, funny how that works out. Um, and uh, uh, granted, there's also been a shift in the global trade. Um, uh, there's been a, an easing of supplying the market with enough oil from Saudi Arabia and some of their OPEC deals that have happened in recently. Um, and uh, America is more than capable of providing a lot of that oil. Uh, however, what concerns me is some of uh, what the Wall Street analysts call uh, moving from uh, a deficit to a sufficiency to dominance, as in having this much oil will increase the confidence uh, of the United States to more dominate foreign policy. Some of the articles had uh, market analysts use those words, uh, and that concerns me as a libertarian because I don't see uh, how self-sufficiency should be or could be taken on to further uh, will the U.S.'s agenda uh, in, in different countries, uh, especially if a lot of the strife that we have to go through or that the, uh, uh, the powers that be go through has to do with things like petroleum. Right. Yeah, I mean, that can so, work. Go ahead. So my concern also along that line is we look at when we have the oil embargo. Mm -hmm. And then, every, you know, I always believe U.S. always had oil. Now, maybe it was never shared for whatever the reason is. And we got to a point now where we are trying to move away from dependency on oil. We're trying to create substitute for oil. We're trying to go solar. So what is going to be the incentive if we know we have surplus of oil to really create policies that will move us for that way. Now, the good news is this. You take a place like the United Kingdom, they already put in the process of banning cars that run on fuel by, I think it's 2030 or 20, something like that. So, and I hope they stick to that. So, yes, you might end up having 10 million barrels or 15 million barrels or 20 million barrels. If the rest of the world move away from dependency on I don't think the U.S. will be able to have that kind of impact. Well, the the, uh, the economics of oil and the economic uh, or the environmental impact of oil is a, is a it's a very fascinating uh, subject. Yeah. Uh, there are neighborhood effects. There are community uh, uh, tragedy of the common effects with the 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 the, the, uh, the combustion of fossil fuels, whether it's oil or coal or, or natural gas. If you create carbon dioxide or uh, sulfides or uh, smoke, whatever uh, you know, whatever the exhaust is from burning oil, that affects not just your property but your neighbor's property and the neighbor's property, you know, 10, 15, 20, 100 miles away. Absolutely. So you've got that problem yeah. with with burning anything, whether it's uh, fossil fuel or uh, or wood or whatever. Uh, but on the other hand, you have 
a lot less expense burning hydrocarbons than you do, uh, at least historically, working with solar energy or working with, uh, working with some of the uh, wind energy, some of the other uh, sources of energy that are being espoused by the uh, people who are concerned with, uh, with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the exhaust of burning fossil fuels. To me, it becomes a question of whether or not the exhaust, the pollution caused by burning po uh, fossil fuels, is bad enough or meets a certain, meets a, a bad enough threshold that it needs to be uh, stopped or, or controlled or modified in some way. And we're moving in that direction. I mean, we have EPA uh, standards on uh, particulate emissions and so forth and so on that move in the direction of, of controlling the amount of emissions. with the excuse that we have to stop, you know, we have to secure American supply right. of foreign oil. Yeah. So if we have, if we secured at home, that takes away the excuse for all of these uh, wars in the Middle East. Well, that, that's why I was concerned with this relative backwards thinking from some of these analysts. If we have self-sufficiency and we don't need to engage in some of the same destructive policies and practices that we did before, yeah. why make the case for no, this can further our dominance and use the word dominance in foreign affairs? If we, can, if we can have our house cleaned uh, up. That sounds to me like it's people who want to have dominance one way or the other. Right, right. right. Which so, is wrong. Right. Yeah, and it makes me wonder uh, uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the predispositions of, of the folks writing this material and, and the kind of analysts that they're including in these articles yeah. and steering the debate in a, in a particular way. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a shooting, many shootings over the last few years. Actually, less shootings over the last few years than historically. But there have been some very high-profile sh shootings over the last a few months, the one in Las Vegas, the shooting at the church in, uh, in Texas, and most recently a shooting uh, at, a, at a school in, uh, in Kentucky. Uh, the interesting common denominator on all these shootings, the church, well, not necessarily the church, the Las Vegas shooting and the, the, uh, the uh, Kentucky school shooting both occurred in gun-free zones. No guns allowed in schools, no guns allowed in public venues. There were actually guns allowed in the church, it just happened that nobody had one. But the, the, the killer in that Sutherland, Sutherland Springs uh, shooting, he was, he was finally stopped by somebody outside the church who, uh, who uh, chased him down. So it was the, the, the presence of a gun of an armed civilian that was able to prevent that mass killer from doing even more damage than he already had. The ability for that to happen in Las Vegas or in any, any school anywhere is nil because nobody uh, except the bad guys have guns. 
so the question is, do guns free zones actually cause more mass shootings? I would say yes. And I would say no. <laughs> okay, I, I'm, I'm, inter I'm always interested in hearing, hearing uh, an argument yes. that is not based on emotion and fear, but Absolutely. one that's based on reason yeah. and logic. Yeah, you know, I, I, I say no, you know, simply because the concept of mass shooting, the way we are knowing it now, is, is stemming from something that is not being focused on. Now what? Not being focused on, you know, the, the main thing. If you look at the common denominator, is somebody having mental issue. In my own case, it would be somebody that's unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, 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 and so, so whether it's gun-free zone or gun-allowed uh, uh, zone, that will not change it because a person... It would change it in one respect. If it's a gun-free zone, nobody's going to stop the killer. If it's a, a zone where people are free to carry, it, you know, he, the, the killer can kill maybe one or two or three people, but he's going to get stopped. Yeah, so how would that have worked in the case of Las Vegas? Where the guy was shooting from, from Shoot uh, back. the story, you would have to be, it would be it would have been a really good right. shooter. Yeah. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Actually, let, 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 let's take that back. I read a situation. There was a guy that was in the concert that had a gun. He had a gun, and his body told him, "Don't touch your gun, because if your gun, if they, if the police start hearing bullet coming from your side, they can start shooting on us because they don't know who the shooter is." You know, there, there would be that problem. But. I, yeah. I think that so, was a bit of a special case, though. I mean, walking no. into a school and shooting, in a sense, there versus being in the high rise, totally separated. I mean, that was basically a sniper. Right, that's what I'm sniper. saying. That's, that's what I'm saying. So that did not help. But the reason I say no is this it, it compounded that feeling. So let's say a scenario there's four or five of us that have gone. Because one of the things that we know for sure is when a shooter starts, the authority doesn't have no clue where it's usually coming from. There is massive panic, okay? Now, they're going through all kind of training to try to clamp down and all stuff. So all of a sudden, you have five different people have gone pull out trying to get the shooter. Who is the shooter? Unless we can relax and not be in panic and say, okay, that's the shooter. That just creates more commotion from my point of view because what if there's another person who was planning to do something but couldn't really do it because there was gun free zone and now a shooter started to say, whoa, I think I can get involved in this now and they start doing their own shooting. It just Yeah, we're, we're really, I mean, yeah, we can argue hypotheticals. It's a war zone. Yeah, we can argue hypotheticals, you know. As as, exactly, you know, that's what I'm saying. So all, all for me, it's, okay, it's good to focus on one person that's been planning for an extended period of time to come and do damage for whatever the reason and find a way to clamp them down than have five or six or seven or ten other people who have no real training to start trying to shoot on somebody. It, it just creates more chaos than solution. I, th I think the empirical evidence uh, would, would say otherwise. Uh, if you take a look at some of the, the work of John Lott, who, who did unrefuted work uh, in uh, shootings, he did a county-by-county county study across the entire United States. And the higher the gun ownership in a county, the lower the homicide rate. And that was a multi-year longitudinal study. It was a study that very, very clearly pointed out that an armed society is a more polite society. And I agree with you that the biggest problem with particularly mass shooters is a mental health issue of one kind or another. It might be substance abuse, it might be uh, mental health untreated, any number of different things, or mental health treated with uh, uh, medicines that have side effects. There's a whole lot of different uh, things going on that would cause a person, and mostly their mental health problems, that would cause a person to do the horrendous things that were done in Las Vegas, in Kentucky, and in, in Texas. I was going to say, just a quick add-in on that, on the societal level, it's been proven in various studies, time and time again, that uh, the, the, the folks behind uh, massive atrocities, whether in the Soviet Union or Mao's China, all of those things uh, uh, 
first one of the first steps to that was removing all of the arms of the community. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, you, coming from coming from Russia, right. you know that Stalin killed what eighty million, something like that. Uh, well, the conservative estimates is between uh, fifty and sixty million. Okay. Uh, but Mao killed but another we, killed another thirty million. Yeah, it's not like there was really good records. For exactly, that kind of stuff. Uh, Hitler killed eleven million, something like yeah. that. These were all societies where the first thing that Hitler, Stalin, Mao did is they made damn sure that their citizens were unarmed before the killing began. Right. Pol Pot in Cambodia killed something like, I forget, a huge percentage of the population. Uh, so the people to be afraid of, really afraid of, are not necessarily the mentally ill random shooters. They are governments that get under the control of menti mentally ill sociopathic <laughs> psychotics. More often yeah. than not. Which yeah. happens. Yeah. And, and it's hap it happened throughout the 20th century. Right. And, and, and that takes us from the premise of the question, which is gun shooting in schools, if I understand correctly. That was where we started. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So in schools. Yeah. So then that's where I'm concerned about. Now, I throw in something that's totally out of it. And I've posed this every single time a mass shooting show up in the news. And that is, have you ever experience or observe, whether empirical or not, any shooter that woke up that day and said, you know, I'm so happy today, let me see how many people I can kill. You're absolutely right uh, that the solution to any kind of psychotic behavior is uh, to uh, be more happy to start with, yeah. more thankful. Yeah. More and, and another thing with the happy part is paying attention and because we live in a society that says, you can't say you are not happy. So even when someone is hot in the inside and you say, how are you? Oh, okay, fantastic, you know? And so neighbors don't know who is happy and who is not happy until they break out. And then they say, whoa, he was always smiling. He's not like him. You don't know him because he cover up very well. So if we start to be more human and be more social and be more, take the time to know, I think we can know someone who has a mental issue, and we can be able to even stop them on their track. Certainly, certainly worth a goal worth striving for. Right. State of the Union uh, happened uh, here uh, recently, and uh, I was able to, because it's part of my job, <laughs> sit through the hour and a half or what, hour and forty minutes, whatever the heck it was. It was very long. It was very tedious, it w and there was no, there were very very few surprises. There was one surprise. I, I was very pleased to hear that President Trump is encouraging the uh, use uh, or the, the, the possibility for uh, terminally ill patients to use drugs which have not been approved by the FDA. He didn't go far enough. Right. I, I would say that anybody that wants to try uh, a drug not approved by the FDA at their own risk should be able to do so. Yes. But, but it's a step in the right direction. The rest of the uh, state of the, well, he did a couple of other things that, that I, th I thought were positive. He said that, uh, the cutting back of the regulatory state, cut uh, two, uh, uh, two um, uh, regulations for every one that's passed, getting regulations checked in by the federal government, that's a step in the right direction. It kind of depends on which regulations right. we're talking about. Some regulations might be okay, but for the most part, most regulations uh, have no have more, more negative consequences than they have positive consequences. So that's a step in the right direction. But the rest of it, what do you think? Well, first of all, I'll say that I was at work, uh, uh, so and I made a conscious effort not to watch the actual screening of it. Uh, I did watch the, the notes of it beforehand and after, and I watched some of the reviews and some of the uh, breakdowns, like with the Libertarian Party. Um, and I can say that I'm not really surprised by very much that was uh, discussed there. Um, there's the, a lot of common points talking about uh, uh, the growing the economy, that's all well and good. Um, but overall, it was more of a, I felt like it was an attempt of a reset towards what could be, what could happen next year. I didn't find this year very productive other than things like cutting back on some of the regulations. Edwin, so, what was your take on the uh, state Well, of I didn't watch it. Okay. Yeah. You're, so. you're two very intelligent guys on the show. First time I haven't watched the state of the Union. I only did it, it because it was my job. Right. Sorry. And maybe I would have if it yeah. was my job, but yeah. it wasn't. Yeah. So I you wanted to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and I also wanted to be able to be a buffer because every time something gets in the news, I, my office is in a 25 story building, so there's a lot of employees. 
And so every time they always come to me, like, oh, oh the time. like, calm down, calm down, calm down. And so I wanted to be able to do that on bias. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I didn't know what to do. One of the reasons I went into business, Richard, uh, is to get away from some of the daily political fanfare that would happen. And we're living in a time, especially in this administration, where that's becoming very commonplace. Public record via Twitter accounts um, is, is, is a very shocking thing to me. Um, so the more that we get through all of these changes in our society, the more I just want to focus on uh, developing the, the things in the private sector rather than running around crazy and, and arguing with, with a lot of different people. Yeah, I, it's interesting, uh, particularly in the years uh, PT, post-Trump, uh, we're living in uh, uh, an area, in an era where everybody is in a silo as far as opinions are concerned. We've got uh, the, the, the resistors and the, uh, the, you know, the antifas, you know, the, the left is in a silo and they listen to each other and nobody else, they don't listen to Fox or anybody on the right. Same way with the people on the right, they listen to Fox, nothing else uh, to speak of. Or Rush Limbaugh. I mean, you know, you've got you've got two partisan silos. They don't talk to each other. Don't listen to each other. And you know, the sad fact is, there are good things that come from the left. There are good things that come from the right. There are probably more bad things that come from both sides than there are good things. But nevertheless, uh, if, if people don't talk with each other, and I'm talking about I'm not talking about politicians. I'm talking about actual people. people yeah. uh, if they're not talking with each other and hearing each other, then it tends to you tend to stereotype. And the you know the, the polarity gets reinforced, and you end up with more and more bad stuff happening at the governance level than good stuff. And along that line, again, this season. I mean, I've been in this country for more than thirty years now. This season, especially, individual have taken it more personally. Yeah. And I've never experienced that. So so. I have to maintain neutrality as much as I can. You sure, know? yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, because I've seen friends, especially on Facebook, defriend themselves, oh, yeah. and they've been friends forever. You yeah. know, and, and and I'm like, wait a second, wasn't there politics among you guys before? <laughs> yeah, but somehow they were able to discuss politics, and nobody got to the far end and far end, and so and that is very scary because I think again or at least coming from my point of view, it contributes greatly to the level of unhappiness because if you're on the right and you were friends to somebody on the left, now you can't even have a dialogue for fear that politics will come in and for fear that you guys could end up being no friends again. And that that actually, I think, it's, I think what, what's happening, it's an opportunity for libertarians because libertarians, we accept conservatives. We accept liberals. We love both conservatives, conservatives and liberals to join the, the Libertarian Party, vote Libertarian. The only thing that we require, the only thing that we say is that you cannot use government to force your views on others. Yeah. You can have your, whatever views you want. Just don't use government to force them on others, whether it's from the left or from the right. And we're talking common sense. We're talking common sense solutions that the polarized Democrats and Republicans simply don't talk to each other about. So a couple of points. One of the quotes is, taking over the world to leave everyone alone, right? I love that. I think <laughs> I have a sticker of it somewhere. Um, another thing is, is one of the best decisions I made in 2017, going into the 2017 year, uh, was to remove myself from Facebook. And I gotta tell you, uh, my level of, of contentment and, and happiness on a daily basis has risen dramatically. You know, I haven't made that step yet, but I, what I have done is I look at my Facebook page once per day, late in the day. Yes. And I don't pay any attention to it other than that. Absolutely, and there's a study that just came out. There's a study about 1.1 million teenagers. If you spend zero time on screen, which screen could be Facebook, test, mm -hmm games, you get a be on, you'll be unhappy if you spend zero time. If you spend more than two hours, you grossly become unhappy, grossly, you know. So the idea they say one hour or less a day. Okay, so there's, a, there's an actual quantitative this, amount. Yes, so it just came out zero, five days ago. Yes. Zero was not right? Zero is not good. Zero was not good? No. More than, more more than, than two, two hours? More than two is not good. Okay, so there's so okay. It's somewhere not in the work. neighborhood. Yeah. It's not, not going to work for business, i got to tell you. No, no, no. Sometimes no. it's a 16-hour staring at a screen. And, and, and that is true. I think the, the researcher exempt business situation because in the business case, 
is not just staring at the screen to avoid people. You are engaged. Right. So what a lot of the teenagers are doing subconsciously, they are using it to disengage. Okay. Yeah. You know, so there is no more face-to-face -face encounter. There's no more going to play ball, play basketball, all the things that human beings are supposed to do to socialize. No, no exercise. No exercise. Yeah. All of those are being cut out, and, and that is dangerous. I've seen a lot of cases of, of uh, folks in the generation right, uh, right after mine um, turning to things like VR or augmented reality. Yes. And instead of talking about these things like we are now, their solution is, oh boy, I'm going to save up. I'm going to get this VR, really expensive VR kit, and I'm just going to do out. this zone out. And to me, that's insane. Yeah. But but it makes sense. Playing playing them. Play, playing uh, you know cops and robber games or space right. games. Right. Some of them it's not even games. Some of them are just chat rooms, but with the focus of something silly, and, yeah. and you're you're doing it in a virtual manner. The U.S. government shut down for three days. It's going to shut down again on the eighth, that's maybe. Uh, d d does anybody care? <laughs> <laughs> I wish it would just shut down permanently. But uh, it doesn't. The shutdown is 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 I, I call it nap time. It's not really. I call, I call it paid vacation. Right, that's, for government employees. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, seriously, the, the longest the government has shut down was like a, a month back uh, a few years ago. Ninety-five. Yeah. So, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Did anybody notice back then? Does anybody even remember? Well, that if you go to the park, you will. The what? If you go to the park, right. oh, the yeah. national park, yeah. you will because yeah. the park was closed. That yeah. was the most obvious well, part. And their garbage isn't collected. Yeah. But, but here is my take to government shutdown, and, and this is so far off, I don't even think it even comes to my mind. I think Congress needs to pass a law that says if there is a shutdown, all members of Congress, including the president, get fired. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. And we will never see shutdown well, anymore. Of course not, of course not. Okay, yeah. so, so, so there is no consequence on the folks involved, but yet it really puts the life of the people who are paying them to be there in jeopardy. Well, I, I would, I would, I would agree with your your solution, but I don't think anybody's life is in, gen in jeopardy. Well, maybe not life, but, but no, there is a lot of panic, though. You know, leading to self-imposed. Yeah, and, and it's more more yeah. superficial. I mean, they say discretionary spending is affected, but it's just a small percentage of the discretionary. Yeah, spending. Right. So you're only talking about a third of the budget anyway. Right. Everything right. is else is Defense is going on. It's going to continue. Homeland Security is going to continue. Right. You know, just a few agencies that you know have, a, like I said, paid vacation. And speaking of paid vacation, we're going to take a, a one-week vacation. We're coming back uh, <laughs> next week for the uh, the next edition of Libertarian Counterpoint, which is on the air at www.accesssacramento.org on the net or on the web and uh, Channel 17 in Sacramento and uh, on YouTube. And uh, on top of that, we're on Beastbook. I'm sorry, Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> uh, Liber Libertarian Counterpoint on Facebook. Or face, face Beast, let's call it that. Thank you very much for being part of the show. We'll see you again next week. Thank you.